there's this kind of lingering idea that that marketing has to be this creative, made up, you know, innovative thing that you can't really repeat. And and I think that that kind of myth um, is what stops folks from doing something that's that's very predictable, very repeatable. And it doesn't mean that there's no innovation, that you don't have great ideas, that you don't test things and then decide, well, gosh, this approach for whatever reason works a lot better than this approach. But it's it's the way in which you go about it. It's the way in which you uh, start everything with strategy and then build your you know ninety day plan uh, out from that strategy, as opposed to just re- reacting to the idea of the week, which unfortunately is is a lot of people's definition of marketing. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be extraordinary. Our guest is a marketing consultant, speaker, and best-selling author of Duct Tape Marketing, Duct Tape Selling, The Commitment Engine, and The Referral Engine. His Duct Tape Marketing methodology is used by marketing consultants worldwide. I am honored to have him on the show. John Jantz, welcome to the podcast. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Now, I have to spend, since you said it was going to be extraordinary, I, now I have to spend the first like two or three minutes lowering people's expectations. Ha ha, I doubt that will happen. They should keep them high because I have definitely consumed your content and it is rock star quality. So, John, it's so great to have you here. You're making a massive difference for small, medium-sized businesses all over the world, helping them attract great clients and build their businesses. So you are definitely a hero in our mind over here. But John, for those who have not consumed your information, why don't we start off by sharing your career journey that is that has led you up to the point how you became a worldwide leader in business marketing? Well, sure. So I, I started my own marketing consulting firm uh, actually about 28 years ago. And like a lot of people, I, I decided I wanted to work for myself and had no real plan. And, uh, you know, if somebody said they needed marketing, I said, sure, I can, I can do that. Uh, a few years in, I kind of found that I had a mix of clients and I kind of found that I really enjoyed working with small business owners. But they were kind of challenging in some ways. I mean, they had the same problems and needs as much larger organizations, but certainly never the same budgets or even attention spans. So at one point, I decided what I needed to do if I wanted to work with small businesses was to create uh, a very systematic, almost product-like approach where I could walk in and say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to do. Here are the results we hope we can get. And by the way, here's what it costs. And that was really the genesis of duct tape marketing. I thought if I'm going to create this system. I've got to give it a kind of product sounding name. And what's funny is that in an attempt to solve my greatest frustration, I think I I tapped what is still today one of the greatest frustrations for a lot of small business owners. It's very difficult to buy marketing services in a very comprehensive way. I mean, everybody's selling a piece of the puzzle. I mean, even the, the, you know, the advertising folks, the, the yellow pages folks are now, you know, chipping away at at pieces of, of the marketing uh, channel. And so, this this approach of somebody walking in and saying, here's exactly what you get, here's exactly what it costs, um, I think was very eye-opening. And, and that's really the, in a lot of ways, the, the big idea of duct tape marketing is that marketing is a system. So I filled my practice very quickly and, and started uh, writing about it online, um, really as a way to just market my own business and started having consultants uh, in different parts of uh, the country, North America, and then eventually the world contact me and, and start saying, hey, we, we like that approach too. Uh, how can we start using it? And that was really uh, when the Duct Tape Marketing Consultant Network was born. And, and we now have about 150 marketing consultants, independent marketing consultants uh, around the world that are installing the Duct Tape Marketing System in thousands of small businesses at any given time. Wow. It's, it's remarkable. And I just love that you 
built a business based on your own need, and now that same system is helping other consultants all over the planet. We love to talk about system and and process on this podcast. And you did mention systems. Why do you think predictable and repeatable marketing systems are required for small business? Well, I, th- I think systems are the key to any business. And and frankly, you know, most people get that. They, they typically have systems to do whatever it is the work is done, you know, to get the bills paid. I mean, a lot of the, the various elements of their business. But it, for some reason, the, the, there's this kind of lingering idea that, that marketing has to be this creative, made up, you know, innovative thing that you can't really repeat. And, and I think that that kind of myth um, is what stops folks from doing something that's that's very predictable, very repeatable. And it doesn't mean that there's no innovation, that you don't have great ideas, that you don't test things and then decide, well, gosh, this approach, for whatever reason, works a lot better than this approach. But it's, it's the way in which you go about it. It's the way in which you uh, start everything with strategy and then build your you know, 90-day plan uh, out from that strategy as opposed to just re- reacting to the idea of the week, which unfortunately is, is a lot of people's definition of marketing. Mm. You know, if you were sitting in front of a bookkeeper, they've got a couple of clients, but they, they want to scale their business. They want to attract more clients. Where would you start? Well, the very first thing we do with every client is, you know, who can you help? Now, I know that unfortunately sounds like a really broad question. Well, anybody who needs bookkeeping. Um, And that's unfortunately where a lot of people start. But if you start, if, if you take that bookkeeper and you look at what are their ideal clients look like? What are the challenges they have? What are the ways that they work? Because I think, you know, most of us can can make a list of all the clients we don't want or all the attributes of clients we don't want. Um, and I think we rarely sit down and narrow our focus to the to the ideal client that we do want. Um, and, and sometimes that's just, I like working with this kind of business or I like working with people who have these values. But a lot of it has to do with this is, you know, in a bookkeeper's world, they're they're typically going after a B2B, you know, arrangement. They're they're dealing with businesses. Businesses come in all shapes and sizes and and behaviors and dysfunctions. And I think that that it's really important for you to understand, you know, what's the type of business or what's the type of challenge a business is having that I can help and enjoy doing the work. Um, and I know that 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 you know sounds a little simplistic, but it's amazing. When, you know, I, I take that bookkeeper who's got 20 or 30 clients, they can always identify five that they wish they had more of. And so in a lot of ways, you know, that's what we're talking about doing is kind of narrowing your focus to that ideal client. Now, one of the things that we typically find is that if we can identify that ideal client, there's probably a reason they're ideal. And so we want to really figure out, you know, what is it that we do uniquely that that makes them ideal, that makes them happy, that makes them want to go out and talk about the great experience they're having with us. And a lot of times, you know, that's the second part. So we identify who their ideal client is, but then we want to identify, you know, what's the promise? What's the core message that we want to go out there and start repeating, you know, put at the top of the fold on our website so that we can attract others who want that same very same thing. And I'll give you a quick example. We, we had a client and it's a tree service. And um, so hopefully your bookkeepers can, you know, relate to a tree service. <laughs> we got client. a few trees up here. You got it. Absolutely. So, so um, but, but the, this was a company that, um, that had been around for a long time, third generation, they were local. So all of their messaging was about we're local and we're family owned. And while that's a really positive, great message, we went and we looked at all of the great reviews that they had which are essentially, you know, it's essentially like interviewing your clients because they're they're leaving these things unsolicited. Um, so they're, you know, they're telling the truth. And most of the reviews said they showed up when they said they were going to and they cleaned up the job site impeccably. And so all of a sudden, you know, we show them that. And, and while the family message, you know, doesn't want, we don't want to bury that. What your clients appreciate and value maybe more than that are, are a couple little things that you just do because that's what your dad and your grandpa did. Um, and, and that's what we have to make sure that we're communicating. And so it, it changed all of their messaging and, and really started attracting or, or at least helping them attract people that those things mattered and, and unfortunately their competitors were not doing. 
Mm, I love that story. I think there's a lot to be learned, A, from understanding what your clients are saying about you and then looking at that objectively to say, what what exactly is it that they value working with me? And what a great story. I mean, leaving the job site clean in this day and age likely is, if you've ever had it done the opposite way, would have been a very powerful message for the marketplace. Yeah, and, and we have a couple processes. I mean, if you've got a lot of reviews, take some time and read through those. You'll see some recurring themes. I can almost guarantee it. Um, but short of that, what we typically do is is we will try to get six or eight uh, clients of of a client and and sit down with them and interview them and ask them those questions like, okay, what do they do that others don't? And and then push a little bit like when they say, well, they provide good service. We you you've got to push and say, well, what is good service? look like to you or, or my favorite, um, tell me a story about a time we provided great service. And then you'll start hearing those themes that probably ought to be front and center in your marketing message. Mm, beautiful. And I think that's really where the value of your consultants, your, your, your network of consultants come in is that often it's difficult to hear and listen to people talk about your own company, whereas someone who has uh, an outsider's view, they can hear different things and see different things and ask different questions than maybe you would if it was your own company. So I'm sure that's a very powerful process. But number one, it starts with if you had to do it and you just wanted to start, one would be just start talking and asking questions of your customer. What is it that you value? value of what we do and bring that into, if you can see a common theme, bring that into your marketing message. Yeah, and don't be afraid if you think that thing seems kind of small. Um, you know, showing up when you say you're going to show up seems for a lot of people like the barrier to entry. <laughs> but unfortunately, it is a huge competitive uh, advantage in a lot of industries. Mm, absolutely. It's excellent. So, John, when you have your customers sitting in front of you, you've, you've understood, you've talked about, you, you help them recraft their marketing message. Once a person has a good, solid focus on their marketing message, what's the next step? There's so many different, op, you know, social media, there's advertising, there's, like you mentioned, yellow pages, so many different places, so many different, uh, really new, new things to do to market your business. Where, where does one start? Well, there's a couple avenues. I mean, first, where do your ideal customers, remember we talked about them first, you know, wh where do they hang out? What do they read? Are they on Facebook? Or are they on LinkedIn? I mean, that's sort of an obvious thing. But but as you're trying to prune down um, the, and I, I should have used that as an example with my tree service. Definitely but, flowing here with the analogy, <laughs> yes. But uh, if, if you're trying to prune down the fact that, I mean, we routinely talk about 16 different channels now. Um, and so, you know, if you're overwhelmed and you're thinking, well, I can only play in two or three places, um, first and foremost, you know, what's the highest priority as far as where your prospects hang out? Uh, the second thing is, especially if, if somebody's been around for a while, I love to look at, you know, a lot of times we – we have a tendency to want to go to the new thing and we underestimate the value of the thing that's actually working for us. But what I mean by that is that, you know, I have a lot of organizations and tr truthfully, this is uh, this is really common of, of small businesses that they are built one of two ways or maybe a combination of these two ways. They are typically built because the founder of the company was pretty good at going out and talking to people and selling. Um, and the second way is their customers like them and they talked about them. <laughs> and so they got you know a lot of word of mouth and referrals. And yet you fi rarely find a business that says, you know what, how can we take sales, our sales channel and our referral channel and use some of these new things to amplify those? So for example, when we come into a business and we find that those two things exist, we try to create a very uh, formal way in which they're going to start generating and amplifying their referability. And we start trying to use things like content as a way to arm their salespeople to open some doors and help them do prospecting um, in ways that, uh, that they weren't able to do before, rather than just looking at these other channels as some sort of disconnected new way in which you're going to, uh, uh, to reach the market. And, and I think that that's, uh, that lesson is for a lot of business owners, you know, when I really get them to understand that, it's almost a relief because I think one of the biggest 
stresses that a lot of small businesses feel today is they feel like they have to be in all 16 of those channels doing something. And so consequently, they get in about 12 of them doing nothing. Mm. Um, and so, you know, narrow it down to two or three and use some of these things like social media or other kind of newer tools to amplify those two or three that are already working. I love that. So when we think of bookkeepers, one of the the main one is 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 going to be referrals. I mean, there's not many bookkeepers that are going to tell you they don't get any referrals. In fact, it, in many cases, it's it's the only way they're getting business is through referrals. So knowing that, what would be your recommendation to amplify their referral business? Well, you know, a lot of people still are under the and, 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 you know, 30, 40 years ago, this was probably true. You did good work. People told people about you. But today, you know, we as business owners have all these channels. We'll imagine all of our customers and all everything they're bombarded with. So we actually have to make it very easy for them to refer us. And, and typically when we go in, and Bookkeeper is a great one because there are three or four kind of tried and true processes for referrals that uh, that that can be used. Now, I, I, I put the big asterisk here. It's nobody's going to refer you unless you're doing great work, unless they like what you're doing. So, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I wrote the referral engine and, and you know, half of that book, so, some people kind of complained and said, well, I don't, this book isn't about referrals because I spent about the first half of the book teaching people how to be referable. Uh, because that's step number one. But once you have that, if you're getting referrals and are already because people are happy, you know, start doing things like making it part of the sales process. So when you go out and talk to a prospect, uh, start mentioning that that you <laughs> here's what we agreed upon today. We're going to make sure that you are so happy with what we agreed upon today that we're going to come back in 90 days and we're going to ask you to introduce us to three other business owners that you think could be need to be this happy. Does that sound like something you would do, Michael? <laughs> um, and and you know. Every business owner that we get to do that is as as maybe cliche as it sounds. Um, you know, people agree. I mm. mean, basically, if you think about it, you are promising that they're going to be happy. You're going to come back and make sure they're happy, and at that point, you're going to help them make somebody else happy. I mean, who, who would say no to that? Uh, obviously, you've got to perform, but that you know, planting that seed um, is one way that you you start kind of getting the referral mindset in place. But also stay top of mind. I mean, once a quarter, mail all of your clients and and give them some sort of tangible gift certificate that uh, that they can hand to a, a a friend or colleague because that's how referrals happen. You know, somebody's playing golf and they go, ah, dang, we need to do blah blah blah, and then somebody's like, oh yeah, I just got that thing from my uh, my bookkeeper. So you know, make sure that you're doing things to stay top of mind and keeping you know referrals kind of front and center. The other thing that there's kind of two more, and I'm, I'm cut me off if I'm rambling. No, too much. I'm loving it. Keep on going. Two more that I love to do. One is that if you have those clients that are referring, make sure that you are doing something for them. Make them champions. Create a, you know, if you're in a local um, environment where most of your clients are local, you know, create a couple of events just for them. T- take four or five of them out to lunch at the same time because if they're business owners in the same community, you're, you're rewarding them by basically creating some network opportunities for them. So so really make sure that those people that refer you know how much you appreciate it. And I, I'm not a big fan of monetary rewards. Um, I think appreciation goes a heck of a lot farther in that type of environment. And then the, uh, the last one is that don't forget the opportunity for referrals from strategic partners. So often we get very focused on our clients. I mean, they, they know how brilliant we are. So of course they're going to refer us. But there's that, you know, non-competing business that also serves your ideal client that perhaps you could start doing some things together, you know, content opportunities together, workshops together. Maybe you've created an incredible workshop for small businesses and the bank would actually, you know, love to have you come in and share your expertise. Well, that that to me is a referral because that bank is is essentially loaning the trust they have with their customers to put you in front of uh, some some potential customers. And the beauty of, of kind of really taking that approach is that, you know, a, 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 a client may have three or four friends that they could refer you to, you know, that bank might have three or 400. Uh, so, so think about building a, an entire team of best of class providers for pretty much everything that your customers 
might need, uh, other services that they might need that you don't offer, um, and start looking for ways to build a, a, a strategic partner platform almost or network uh, because it could turn into your greatest source of referrals. And, and it also allows you you know, when you have that client that says, oh, gosh, you know, you know, I need we need, you know, you're doing their books and it's clear, clear that they need a line of credit. <laughs> well, maybe you can actually connect them with that banker uh, that you now have a relationship with and, and you'll increase your value with your clients. It's remarkable. You've given uh, some really, really great examples, plus super um, ex, you know, for a bookkeeper to actually execute on these things, I mean, very straightforward. And you've really nailed it. Bankers, um, there would be tax accountants or accountants, but bankers. I mean, what a what a great opportunity. And I I know personally that bankers are always looking for opportunities to educate their customers and build relationships with their customers. So that's doing them a service by actually providing content that's valuable. Uh, as long as, as you say, you got to be great and you've got to have valuable content and have a, a great presentation that's going to help them but what a what an excellent opportunity to not only find new customers but to build another uh, opportunity for referrals to come from these people that might not even be customers but might have seen you speak and really liked you and said hey you know I know somebody that you should maybe talk to really great opportunity out there for for all of our listeners now you mentioned one thing you said not only are they, our listener, busy, right? They're busy and referrals used to be, hey, you know, I'm going to refer you and it's almost like top of mind, but so many different things happening in the world. Our customers are, are super busy. What do you find with your clients around their time and, and ability to do some of the things that we're talking about? I mean, they're time starved. Yeah, I think, I mean, we could have a whole nother show now on this question. Uh, <laughs> well, um, the biggest thing that we try to do, I mean, the reality is, and this is kind of hard medicine for people to take. The reality is we waste about 75% of our time, uh, you know, checking email, doing things that, you know, we go down these rabbit holes. Uh, it's just really easy to get distracted. So a lot of what we try to do is help business owners get focus. And that's what a, a system really does. It's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't ever look at any kind of incoming opportunity that might present itself. But instead of chasing everything and reacting to everything and feeling like you need to do everything, you know, we, we get them to identify. We, I like to take quarters because I think uh, 90 days are, you know, it's great to have that five-year vision. But the fact of the matter is, you know, looking out 90 days is, is pretty far for a lot of people. So, we try to help them create two or three core priorities in that quarter. And then we identify, so, so those are kind of the strategic objectives for the quarter. And then we try to identify, you know, what are the goals then to meet those strategic objectives? How are we going to track it? Um, and what projects or tasks need to come, you know, need to happen so that we can meet those objectives. And really, you know, the, the hope is that we will ignore everything else, that, that we will, you know, have a, me a weekly staff meeting. We'll say, how are we doing on these objectives? You know, what's working, what's not working? Okay, go. Rather than, hey, anybody got any new ideas for what we should do this week, which is unfortunately how, you know, a lot of things happen. And, and you know, business owners are the worst. I mean, they, they go to a party or they read a new book and they come back with, a, you know, a whole list of new objectives. And so focus is is really uh, the business owner's friend, uh, because there, there's so much of what gets our attention uh, that shouldn't. And and part of that uh, equation, I guess, is to also understand, you know, what your best use of your time is, what's your highest payoff activities. And at the beginning of the day, if you're making up your to-do list and about 70% of that stuff on your to-do list is not very high payoff work, maybe it's actually work you could get somebody to do for little or no uh, compensation. I, I, I don't, I mean, far little, far less than what the owner of the business <laughs> should, should be counting on making, uh, then you, you've got kind of your list for start, you know, to start delegating. And, and I think that that, you know, that's what sucks a lot of business owners in so quickly. They get a couple clients, hey, they got time, they can do everything. Then all of a sudden they get a couple more clients and, and some balls start dropping because they are still trying to do everything. So figure out what you can't do, what you shouldn't do, what you uh, won't do, um, and start uh, figuring out how to delegate those before you feel like you can even afford it. I so love it's, it. It's focus and delegation. Those are the two keys.
I think it's great. And it comes back to what you said about looking first at what's already working when we're talking about marketing. What's already working, there's two or three things perhaps, and then amplify those. I just absolutely love that. So for the listener right now, look at your next 90 days. What's already working? Where are you getting business from? Focus on those things, amplifying those things. Make those work better instead of going and looking for something new or shiny or different that somebody else is talking about and just work what's already working. I love your – I come back to that example of the bank. You know, that is a uh, a massively leveraged opportunity where you think – you could go into social media and you could start, you know, tweeting and putting posts on Facebook. But to actually have a bank put together a room full of potential prospects for you and then you go and present for one hour or 45 minutes or whatever the case may be and be able to be in front of live real human energy in front of all of those people in that room there could be 10 20 15 30 different people the leverage opportunity there and the impact that's potentially going to happen is incredible and so if one bookkeeper would just focus on building one relationship with one banker that's going to tee that up in the next 90 days. I mean, that could be extraordinary growth for the business right there. So focusing, doing what's already working and being really, really clear on who you want to attract into your business. This has been absolutely gold coming in from you, John. Now, yeah. And so now I want to say this, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit about duct tape selling because we've been talking a lot about marketing. But when it comes to selling, that's a different animal. And, you know, you can attract them and have these these referrals coming in, but to powerfully sell them and sell them at a, a rate that maybe is higher than what people would expect, what would you have to say about uh, helping our bookkeepers who are typically introverted by nature? How would you help them with their selling? Well, I... I think one of the challenges with selling and it's why I wrote duct tape selling actually is, you know, the subtitles think like a marketer, <laughs> sell like a superstar. I think a lot of what I was trying to do with that was for business owners was get rid of this notion of what they think selling is. Uh, and unfortunately we've all been uh, victim of, you know, this, the, the bad, you know, sales experience. And I think a lot of us feel like, well, that's what we have to do. We have to go out and close people. And I think today, you know, selling is really about providing insight. It's about, first off, it's about educating people on, you know, what their challenges are and helping them come to grips with, you know, how they might solve those challenges. But then it's simply a matter of providing enough value up front that, that they believe you are the obvious choice. And and certainly a lot of what you can do with marketing is, is you know, you really, by raising your expertise, by raising your profile, by going out and doing this speaking, uh, you know, all of a sudden you become the recognized expert. And a lot of the kind of traditional convincing people they should buy from you kind of goes out the door. And and what happens is, you know, people, you, you set up a situation where people want to work with you, that they understand, you know, how you're different. They understand, you know, that other people trust you and that other people um, expect to pay a premium to work with you. And that's, that's one of the real values of kind of raising your authority or your credibility in a market is that people do expect to pay more and the, the sales cycle gets really short because it's really a conversation about how you're going to work together rather than why they would pick you. Beautiful. I absolutely love that. And it's it's changing the thinking to more uh, when we're marketing, when the listener when the listener is marketing their business, it is about creating the knowledge and understanding and and authority so that they're coming as buyers and they're coming as buyers that will pay premium. Absolutely love that. It's almost taking that whole conversation of selling out. You're creating buyers versus creating sales opportunities. Yeah, and, and a lot of it, though, is to understand, you know, what you do and who you can work with. Because one of the ways that you get really, really attractive to a buyer is that you start turning people away, uh, that, that you start saying, you know what, you're not a good fit. And, and it's not a you know, an egotistical thing at all. It's you, your experience has told you that you can't help that business. Maybe it's because they won't listen or they won't do what you're what you're going to ask them to. But the bottom line is, once you start getting good at that, um, all of a sudden um, you will find that you will spot uh, the opportunities that are the right fit, and you won't have to sell anymore. Beautiful. You know. John, I'm looking at this list of books, Duct Tape Marketing, Duct Tape Selling, The Commitment Engine, The Referral Engine. 
I'm thinking the listener needs to go to Amazon and do a book bundle, buy all these books, get them onto their shelf, because this really, if you're a small business or medium-sized business, this is required reading to grow your business. And if you're not into reading, go and get an ad- Audible app, because I know most of, if not all of your books are on Audible as well. Is that correct? Right, they all are. Yeah, They're All on Audible. You can listen while you're driving to that next client. You can be listening to wonderful, powerful, actionable resources to grow your business. John, this has been absolutely terrific. Let our listener know if they want to find out more about you or they want to work with you or one of your wonderful consultants that you have all over the planet, how can they get more information? Well, just uh, start your search at ducttapemarketing.com and that's D-U-C-T-T-A-P-E marketing.com. And you, you can find a list of the consultants there. You can find a list of the kind of a la carte services that my organization offers. We have uh, a, a training course. You know, I do, in fact, I was, uh, depending upon when you listen to this, but uh, at least today, um, you know, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to do a, a monthly webinar that's part of our kind of system training course uh, for, for businesses out there. So lots of ways for you to, to lurk and learn and get resources. But then obviously, if you want to take some action, uh, there's lots of places for that as well. It's excellent. Well, I'm a big fan. I've consumed a lot of your your materials. It's been very helpful to me. And so I look forward to seeing and consuming more of it and, and looking out on the horizon what might be next. John, you've built a wonderful business. And again, it's been great having you. Oh, thanks, Michael. It's great being here. That wraps another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast and what an excellent podcast episode it's been. To learn more about today's guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.